Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week I'm covering a case suggested to me by viewer Caleb, so thank you in advance. We're discussing the case of the Gavis family from Spotsylvania County, Virginia. In 1978, the middle child, Patrick Christopher Gavis, seemingly flipped a switch and attacked his family. As always, I ask you to join me as we remember John, Edith, and Mark Gavis. The Gavis family consisted of John Gavis, his wife Edith, and their eight children, John III, Michael, Edith, Julia, Mark, Peter, Patrick, who went by Christopher, and Richard. John Gavis, the patriarch, was a farmer and part-time letter carrier who operated a sawmill with the help of his family. Gavis was discharged from the Marine Corps in 1969. He went through the ranks and received battlefield commissions in Korea and also served in Vietnam. He received numerous decorations during his service, including three Purple Hearts. According to family, John grew tired of the military and wanted out. He was eventually able to retire and focus on his 200-acre farm located on Towles Mill Road. The farm they called Windy Hill sat in the rolling countryside. It contained a sawmill and about 50 sheep. John attempted farming but was unsuccessful, so he stuck to what he knew, lumber. At its peak, the mill produced 5,000 feet of lumber a week from trees on the farm. In 1975, John found part-time work as a substitute rural mail carrier for the Spotsylvania Post Office to supplement his income. John Gavis was described as a person everybody liked, and he did everything for his children. He was hardworking and kind-hearted, and he expected his children to always do the best they could. Edith was described as a warm person who helped in numerous community organizations. She was very active in the PTA at her children's school and occasionally taught at the Livingston Elementary School. Edith didn't single out any of her children for favoritism. They were all special to her. Both parents took an interest in their children and were very involved with their schooling and extracurriculars. According to neighbors and friends, the Gavis family were the ideal family. Often referred to as the Waltons, the Gavises had no apparent domestic issues, and any issues that did arise, they overcame together. Those who knew the family described them, first of all, as devout Roman Catholics. The Gavis family were members of St. Mary's Catholic Church. When they attended church, they went in two car trips and never missed a service. By 1978, only four children still lived at the farm. The eldest children moved on. John III and Michael were in New Orleans working as deep sea divers, while Julia and Edith were attending college classes in Richmond, Virginia. Back on the farm, Mark and Peter attended the local high school, while Chris and Richard attended the junior high school. Peter was a sophomore and on the wrestling team. Mark was a senior and president for the Spotsylvania High Student Cooperative Association and also a member of the wrestling team. According to Mark's principal, he excelled in his studies and had plans to enroll in college after graduation. Chris was an 8th grade student who was a member of the school band. The school stated all of the Gavish children were fine students who earned good grades and stayed out of trouble. No one could have anticipated what happened next. On the evening of March 28, 1978, both Edith, John, and their sons were at home. The day was like any other. The children went to school. John completed his mail route, and they all returned to the farmhouse. The family shared some time together before retiring to their rooms. The clocks read shortly after one in the morning, when the youngest son, Richard, age 13, woke up to the sound of a gunshot. Initially, he didn't think anything of it. The family were outdoorsy and owned several firearms. He thought maybe it came from outside. He didn't hear any arguing or painful cries, so he just tried to brush it off but then a second shot rang out. He started to pull himself out of bed to check out the situation when he was suddenly face to face with his older brother, Chris, aged 14. According to a phone interview conducted days later, Richard asked Chris what the hell he was doing. He stood in the doorway, shotgun in tow. 
Chris was expressionless and didn't reply to his brother's question. Instead, he raised the gun and fired. Richard was struck in the chest. As Chris walked away, Richard struggled towards his pillow. He removed the pillow filling and stuffed it into his wound to help stop the bleeding. The oldest son, Mark, aged 17, was on the hallway floor with a shotgun wound to his leg and hip. Mark was woken up by the initial gunshot. He charged Chris to try to disarm him, but was unsuccessful. Richard remembered hearing Mark begging Chris to get help, pleading with him to call the rescue squad. Peter, aged 15, was also in his bedroom, badly wounded, with a gunshot wound to his stomach and arm. But just as suddenly as the nightmare began, it was over. Chris put down his weapon and called for an ambulance, then notified the sheriff's department. The rescue squad arrived at the house around 1.39 a.m., where they discovered the grisly scene. John Gavis was found at the bottom of the stairs, deceased from a gunshot wound to his back. Edith was found at the doorway of the couple's bedroom. She died from a gunshot wound to the chest. Upon their arrival, Mark, Peter, and Richard were alive but in serious condition, with Mark being the worst of the three. Chris was apprehended after he admitted to committing the shootings, and he provided no explanation for his actions. He was transported to the Rappahannock Juvenile Detention Center, where he was charged with two counts of murder, with other charges pending if his brothers died from the injuries inflicted. Inside of the home, five firearms were found, two of which were shotguns. Both were collected as the potential murder weapon. They also collected pellets of 12-gauge buckshot. Some reports claim the house didn't appear to display any signs of excessive violence, but neighbors stated otherwise. Apparently, the walls and carpet were saturated with blood, and the sight was enough to make someone sick. The three survivors were rushed to Mary Washington Hospital, where doctors performed over four hours of emergency surgery in an attempt to save Mark's life. Sadly, two days after the attack, Mark succumbed to his injuries and passed away, surrounded by his family members and with the family priest present. His death was attributed to blood loss from cardiovascular collapse. With the news of his death, classmates and the community campaigned to raise donations, and helped the Gavis family however they could. Richard and Peter remained hospitalized for weeks after the shootings. Peter's condition worsened and was touch and go for a while due to an infection in his wounds and contracting pneumonia on top of it. Both Richard and Peter eventually made a full recovery. Mark's death resulted in a third murder charge against Chris, along with two charges of malicious wounding. Through questioning, investigators were able to determine no arguments preceded the shootings as far as anyone knew, and since Chris already made a confession, they weren't concerned with the motive. They made no further plans to question Chris further to find out why, since the only use motive had at this point was pure curiosity. But the remaining Gavis children wanted answers. Family and friends who not only knew the family for years, but were very close to them, were haunted by the question of why. According to sources close, Chris was described as your typical teenager. He was a quiet boy who didn't cause friction. He had teenager problems like acne, and he didn't like school. He wanted to quit school to join the diving business with his brothers. The family priest stated Chris was a pretty solid, stable individual. A family friend voiced no rumors of family problems and commented that out of all of the children, Chris was the person he liked the most, since he was so easygoing. As previously mentioned, the school stated Chris was a good student, who wasn't a problem. Typically, the school had their list of troublemakers, and the principal explained prior to the incident, he didn't even know a Chris Gavis went to the school. They noted his grades slipped during the last six-week grading period, but it wasn't enough to cause concern. It was a typical trend they saw among students, and they referred to it as the mid-year slump. Chris was a wrestler and a weightlifter at the school. He was solid muscle and nicknamed Animal by teammates because he was as big as an animal, but in reality, a teddy bear. He looked menacing, but he was actually very nice. The school staff noted that Chris came from a religious family with a strict father, but according to Michael Gavis, this was further from the truth. When asked if Chris's crimes were an act of rebellion against their authoritarian father, Michael claimed no. He explained his father had slacked off on his rules and regulations since retiring from the Marines. When Michael was growing up, his father was a disciplinarian, but he never inflicted physical punishment on them. He just took away privileges. 
John Gavis was a fair man to his children, according to Michael. He took the time to listen to their side of the story. During the days following the shootings, no one wanted to piece the puzzle together more than the older children. They couldn't understand what happened to Chris. Initially, the older children refused to believe Chris was the gunman. One of the daughters refused to let anyone clean the scene, fearing potential evidence could be lost. Based on accounts from both Richard and Peter, it was like Chris just flipped a switch. From Richard's perspective, Chris was like a different person, then just suddenly returned to himself again when he started helping them. Peter described his encounter in a similar manner. For him, it seemed like Chris was completely unaware of what happened until it was over. Peter yelled for Chris four times to call an ambulance. It was almost like he couldn't hear him. He finally yelled out Chris's name one more time as loud as he could. And in that moment, Chris looked at him and said, My God, Peter, what happened to you? Michael suggested at one point Chris might have unknowingly ingested drugs. He offered spiked Easter candy as an explanation of how Chris could have been drugged. He explained maybe some prankster laced it with LSD. No one will know for sure though, since no samples of blood or urine were collected by the sheriff's department. It was also later determined no Easter candy was found inside the home. Chris was examined by a psychiatrist from Fredericksburg to determine if he was mentally competent to stand trial. Because of his age at the time, a law in place prohibited Chris's identity from being released to the media. After determining his mental competency, Chris's hearing was closed at the behest of his attorney. This meant records in relation to the crime could not be made public. Chris was judged to be not innocent of the attack in the Juvenile and Domestics Relations Court on October 3, 1978. As punishment, he was sentenced to an undetermined amount of time at the Central State Hospital in Petersburg to undergo treatment. Edith, the eldest daughter, took custody of both Richard and Peter when they were released from the hospital. She chose to raise the boys in the area so they could remain at their schools around their friends. The funeral for John, Edith, and Mark was held on April 3, 1978 at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Fredericksburg. They were buried on their property at the Windy Hill Farm. Chris Gavis was granted permission to attend the service with police escorts. Post-tragedy, the Gavis children branched off and tried to move forward with their lives. Michael left one day and hadn't been seen since. Edith moved out of the farmhouse when she married and took Richard with her. After graduating high school, Richard joined the Air Force. Peter also moved out, but took Chris to court over the hospital debt he incurred from his injuries. He cut Chris from the inheritance. Chris was eventually released from the state hospital. He allegedly married and enlisted in the army. Family said he was stationed in Germany for a while before moving to Texas. John III and Julia, however, faced problems of their own. On August 31, 1983, the siblings who lived at the old farm, isolated from the world, decided to exhume their father's body. According to Julia, spirits in the house told them a microchip with the numbers of a Swiss bank account was in one of his gold crown teeth. Together, they pulled all but two of his teeth and took them to a jeweler in Richmond. The teeth were still embedded in embalming wax. They told the jeweler about the account number, but the jeweler found nothing and melted the crowns down, fashioning them into pendants. Once the siblings were distracted, the jeweler alerted the police. They returned to the farm where it was determined John Gavis's grave was tampered with. Julia and John III were arrested on September 9, 1983 and charged with disinterring a body. When asked about why they would do such a thing, Julia and John explained the spirits were taking over the house. Once they retrieved the microchip, they planned to burn down the farmhouse to rid it of the evil spirits. Julia planned to die in the fire, while John would survive by immersing himself into a water-filled cooler in the basement. When John was arrested, he was wearing a sweatsuit, two layers of underwear, ski boots, and plastic bags covering his feet. He explained these extra layers kept the demons out. When they arrived at the home to investigate the claims made by the jeweler, both Julia and John warned police to not go into a certain room unless they wanted to contract a disease which killed 600 people. According to the other siblings, John and Julia's problems started before the 1978 tragedy, with Edith describing them both as very disturbed. They apparently had been this way for a long time, and no one knew what it was caused by. They just kept cutting themselves off from the world. 
After the murders, John proclaimed he was a minister and planned to hold a 10-day worldwide peace concert on the family farm in 1982. He claimed it would attract millions of people, including Pope John Paul II. But this gathering never happened. Julia claimed her deceased mother tried to talk to her all the time through other people and stated she often heard voices. The siblings were held on $500 bonds. They chose to stay in jail rather than pay, since the bars kept them safe from the demons in the world. Neither Julia or John entered a plea to the charges against them. Both underwent psychiatric evaluations and were found competent to stand trial. The trial started on July 2, 1984 and lasted only a day, where neither Gavis testified in their defense. The following day, the jury returned with the verdict. The siblings were both found guilty of disinterring their father's body and given a conspiracy charge. On August 6, 1984, both received four years each for their role in the crime. Beyond their arrest, the news of John and Julia Gavis stopped short. The remaining members of the Gavis family tried to keep to themselves and often declined interviews. After John and Julia's arrest, the Windy Hill Farm property was auctioned off at the request of Edith. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more from me. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you all again for another week here. You all are the best and I hope you have a great week ahead of you. But for now, we have to part ways. So stay safe out there and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.